and welcome everybody to a very special edition of Modern Soul Conversations. Typically, you know, I have myself and my wife next to me and we're moderating some guests. Um, but I have a good friend with me today that I'm kind of turning the reins over to. So um, this is Rachel Fry. I've known Rachel for as long as been, what, seven, eight years now, Rachel? Yeah, I think it's, I was thinking about that earlier. I think it's been eight. Eight, or eight years. Yeah. So we met eight years ago. Um, you know, we've remained friends. We've kept in contact, even though she's been traveling the world and, and I've done some traveling too. We still keep in contact. Um, we have uh, visions that are in line and I think we're just going to talk about a few things today, but she is going to be moderating. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing the question answering as much as possible. The ones yeah. that I don't dodge. Um, <laughs> you know, but I'm going to turn it over to her and let her get started with it. And, uh, Welcome everybody to uh, the conversation. Cool. Rachel, do your thing. Did, did you want to open us with your quote or? You know, I think today's special, um, but I think it still applies a little bit. So, um, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're skipping the quote. Um, do you want me to introduce myself or do you want to introduce? Yes, yeah, please do. You know, I'm kind okay. of giving people a little background without, you know, reading your resume, but, you know, I want people to know who you right. are from you, and then we'll go from there. Right. So I am currently a positive psychology coach. I am working with motivated individuals, not afraid to go after some of their dreams, some of them that have been sitting in the back of their mind for a while. And I help them get clear on their idea, kind of shift from fear to confidence, and then create like actionable steps toward their goals. Um, I completed my master's in positive psychology this past year, and I use a lot of those studies and practices with my coaching work. And I just wanted to preface a little bit with what positive psychology is, because I think for some people, you know, that comes up a lot in dinner conversations or people are like, well, what did you study or what is that? And a lot of what positive psychology is, is um, like a strengths-based approach to communities and individuals. But in particular, it's looking at what people already do well. So what are we doing well? How can we just focus on that, utilize that in our work or personal life? And when you're doing things that you already do well, you'll find that you're energized, you're excited, you feel more authentic in what you're doing. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody need that type of service? You know, um... <laughs> I know it's a rather interesting um, line of work to go into, but I, mm -hmm. I understand who you are, so it makes sense to me. So, um, yeah. Right. Well, so what I wanted to do with talking with you, um, it, because I think you're such a great example of somebody who continues to go after their their dreams, their goals. Um, you've kind of, I've seen you over the years, like reinvent yourself, whether you've opened it restaurant or your catering business or then you've kind of evolved into this new vision of a new restaurant and you just go after your creative ideas and your visions and to me it's always been inspiring to see that just you know when I've come back from living somewhere else and you check in and I come eat at one of your new restaurants you tell me kind of your vision and I get to see in person what that how that kind of creative vision has come to life for you. Um, so I wanted to talk to you just and ask some questions and, you know, have people listen and hear about your story, you know, your process, what kind of ignites your creativity, what keeps you going after these dreams years. Because it is for some people that would feel really scary or, you know, maybe they wouldn't be motivated or not have that clear vision. And for you, I think it's I know for your followers and people who've been watching your journey over the years, it's probably exciting to see all of the, the different things that you've been able to do over the years. I mean, I hope so. You know, I hope they're <laughs> bored with me. You know, um, but yeah, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm a chef. Um, I'm a husband. I'm a father. Um, you know, that's those are the things that I love. Um, I. You know, enjoy being around my family, you know, but our business is a family business, you know, now, you know, my son doesn't really want to do any, anything to do with it, um, although he helps us out, obviously, when we yeah. need it. But, I mean, I would not be in this line of work without my wife. So anything mm -hmm. that I talk about, when I talk about my dream, my vision, it's, 
you know, one that we share together. And that's why it's been, in my opinion, um, so much more successful because I share that vision with somebody else who, you know, really wants to be there and, and believes in what we're doing. So that's, you know, one part of my saying I should get that out there. You know, right. whenever I talk about what I'm doing, I can never do that without talking about her. Right. Um, but, you know, you know, I'm a chef, you know, I love to cook. I like to tell a story with my food. Um, I think it's important, especially as an African-American chef, that I um, get people to understand not only where the food comes from, but the hands that really made it. And the struggle that went into you know, only getting that seed here from across the Atlantic, but then getting cultivated in the land and then growing it and then teaching others how to utilize it. I think that's a special quality and it's not mentioned. And, you know, that's what part of my mission is. Right. I don't know if I'm answering your questions. Am I going no, on? No, that's good. I saw, I saw your wife hop on to the, she joined early. Oh, she jumped in here. Yeah, yeah she jumped <laughs> in. I'm sure she's watching. Yes, she's, I'm sure she's, she's here. While she's not running around doing what she's doing. <laughs> but, yeah. um, so I guess that was why, that was kind of what my, one of my first questions was, is why has it been so important for you to pursue some of your ideas and make these a reality? Um, you know, I'm a creative person. I, um, I grew up, um, playing music. You know, I was, um, classically trained on the piano when I was younger. Um, and I always was going to be pursuing a job in music. And at one point, you know, I worked for an independent record company. I was a sole producer. So I was writing music, going into the studio, doing recording. That's what I thought my life was going to be. And then, you know, I got married. And I decided that I wanted to be married. And I loved, you know, my wife. And I wanted to make sure that that relationship worked. And it's just not really conducive for married life. Although my wife was willing to travel with me if I had to travel. But so I wanted to do something that, you know, kept me closer to home. Um, ultimately, it didn't keep me closer to home, but nonetheless. Um, so, you know, I started getting into cooking and it was perfect because I needed something to channel that creative energy. And that's, you know, why I pursue food and, you know, it's gone beyond just, you know, me putting food on a plate. Now it's, you know, me now knowing the source of that ingredient, you know, how far back can I trace this ingredient? You know, those are the things that really inspire me. Um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Um, you know, I, you know, I think I'm just uh, the person who likes to, you know, not just keep busy, but, you know, keep busy doing things that I think are meaningful. And that's, think that's what inspires me more than anything. Right. Yeah. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, I know, I know, I don't know if a lot of people did know that you shifted from the music industry. Yeah. Food. I remember when you first told me that. Yeah, we talked proud. about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. but it's cool. And I, I was curious what continues to fuel your creativity. Like, where is that from kind of going after some of these things? Or do you think that like, what for you continues to fuel that fire? Well, I mean, I mean, the story behind it, the mission one, but I'm inspired by what I see, you know, so, and when it talks to cooking, you know, I'm, if I see an ingredient, then my wheels start turning on what I could do with it. Um, because I've had, you know, such a long career, and I've done so many things, you know, and I'm getting a little older, so the mind gets a little jumbled about, you know, thinking about all the things that I've done. So what I'm really inspired now is by when something's put in front of me. Um, when I see, you know, this beautiful piece of whatever, I start thinking, oh, wow, I could do this with that. Well, you know what, let's do this with that. And, you know, I've got this here and I've got this in the fridge. And, you know, then that's when the wheels start turning. And then you start playing around with ideas. And it may take you four or five times um, to get the perfect dish out of what you think you have. Sometimes you nail it right away. You know, um, and those journeys, those things, that's what inspires me. Because sometimes you, you don't get it right away. And I'm not sure if Everybody knows that about chefs and people who cook professionally. When you're creating a dish, it is just that. Mm -hmm. you're, you're creating it just because you have got all these flavor profiles in your head and, you know, you've done these many different things before. If you're trying to create something different, 
sometimes you fail the first time, mm -hmm. but knowing how to recover and, you know, that's all a part of the journey for me. I, that's what inspires me as well, being able to do that. Right. Yes. And hopefully some of us, including myself, we've, we've had the honor of being able to try a lot of your well, you, you creative remember, dishes. Well, you've <laughs> quite a few of those experimental things back yeah. at, um, what was that, Metropolitan, right? Yeah, Metropolitan, yeah. Urban Soul. I'm a big fan. So <laughs> um, my other question was, when when these when do these ideas normally come to you so is it's not just so when thinking outside of being in the kitchen and creating dishes when you're thinking big picture visions like putting together a restaurant or you know approaching a restaurant and being able to create an entire menu like where where how do you kind of go after some of those ideas or you mean like create if i'm thinking about creating a restaurant. I mean, for me, I'm, I mean, it's always about the concept. I mean, I've always got food in my mind. I am very much centered around um, African culture. So whether it's from, you know, am I doing food from Senegal or Gambia or wherever I've traveled or whatever I'm trying to represent, it's centered in Africanness. So Southern food, soul food, Cajun, Creole barbecue, you know, all of those things were, derived from, you know, Africans. So that's where I think about first, okay, what am I trying to do? How am I trying to represent it? Is this a fast casual concept? Is it a more upscale casual? Do we want to do fine dining, tapas, something like that? Those are the things I think about. And then I say, you know what? This is the beautiful space. It makes sense for this concept theory. Okay. And then we'll start looking at the space and then decide, okay, this is what we're going to go into with this concept. And then you start, you know, creating, you know, that's a backdrop. And then you start creating all the major roles that go into making a good menu. Price point is obviously one, you know, featured items. And you start thinking about that and then it starts all falling together for me. Sure. So for you, you think it's more once you're, once you're in momentum, once you're kind of starting, that's when the ideas. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like like I said, you know, I'm I'm inspired by what I see. So if I walk in, if we're looking for spaces, and I walk into, you know, someone, a realtor, somebody shows us a space, I immediately start thinking, oh yeah, yeah, this could work well. No, this isn't the right place for anything that I have in mind. You know, you that happens a lot too. You know, but yeah, I'm very much inspired by what I see. Right. Very much inspired. Cool. Um, what, what do you think some of the main obstacles, because I know you've opened different restaurants and had different projects that you've worked on and you don't seem to get, uh, for me, for what I've seen, it doesn't slow you down. And the, what do you think some of the most common obstacles you've had with some of the ideas and um, projects you've gone after? Um, you know, I mean, we, we all put, you know, barriers on ourselves and, we're our own worst critics, and sometimes we're the ones that hold ourselves back. But I think more so than anything, and maybe not necessarily for me in particular, but for people in general, is funding. You know, when you're trying to launch a restaurant, you know, requires a good deal of capital, um, especially if you're not going into what is considered a second generation kitchen where, you know, there's already a kitchen in, you know, a particular building. Um, so if you have to go in and then build a kitchen, you know, that's adding, you know, maybe another 100,000 plus, depending upon the size of the kitchen and what you want in it, could be much, much, much more than that, um, you know, to build a kitchen out. So, I mean, it's, there are so many obstacles, but the main one is, you know, financing. I mean, it's, it's you know, there are not one banks that are giving loans to single origin restaurants, not a lot of them. Now, they do give some. Um, it is probably based on the credit of the borrower. Um, you know, what are they else they involved in? You know, what is their income primarily? So in the event that the restaurant doesn't work out, they can still get that money back. Um, I, that's the number one thing is financing. I haven't, beyond the other stuff, you know, um, you know, I met a lot of nice people and a lot of people, you know, want me to work with them, you know, but it, then it always comes down to the money. Okay. What does it look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, does it make sense? And unfortunately for African-Americans, 
you know, mm -hmm. certainly, but people in the food business, you know, in general, if you're not a chain or something like that with a, an established track record, it's very hard to get, um, you know, financing. Now, you know, I have a little bit more of a track record, but even with that, it doesn't matter as much with um, when it comes to bank financing. So that's probably the biggest hurdle. Her biggest hurdle is financing. Gotcha. What What do you think would be for you? What's been the, the second biggest hurdle with going after some of these projects? Because I think I think anyone can agree. You know, financing or finding funding, and I mm -hmm. think especially a person in your position. I know that there are unique, more unique obstacles. So um, I, I'm curious. You know, what what would be the second biggest obstacle that you you see recurring? I mean, after financing the second biggest um, location, you know, I mean, if, if we're talking about restaurants in particular, um, you know, then it's location, you know, it's financing location, location has got to be ideal. Um, because it's about foot traffic and all that. Although with COVID and what the restaurant industry looks like on the other side of this, that may all change, it may all be digital or online. Um, but, you know, that was, you know, the other um, hurdle. But, you know, there are things changing in the industry. So that may be a hurdle that may not be as important as it once was. Um, you're always going to need money. So um, that won't go away. But, you know, for me, it's just, I love, you know, um, I love what I do in food. And I'm just, I'm crazy about this history. And that's probably the biggest hurdle for me is being able to do all the crazy ideas I got in my head and make them make sense to the general public. Because, you know, a restaurant is a business, no matter how personal it is to you. Um, and I've had to learn that over the years. You know, you, you fall in love with what you do, um, but it is a business at the end of the day. And if the numbers are not right, it's just not going to work. Right. You know, so. Me, you know, it's, you know, having um, me be able to lock my head down and, you know, drill out the things that I know that are going to make sense. And that's why my wife is a big part of this, because she's a smart woman and she knows um, how to pump the brakes on me when I need to, because I've got, you know, visions of grandeur sometimes. And she'll say, yeah, you know what, um, that will work, but no, it, this won't work. You know, so <laughs> it's, yes. but it's always not that good to have that person to bounce stuff off of. Right. So when you have those kind of bigger visions, is she the, one of the first people that you'll throw an idea out at and see, see what she thinks? Yeah. If, if the vision didn't come from her initially, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I mean, this is our work, like I said, you know, so sometimes the things that we go after are things that she thought about and she said, you know what, we should be doing this. And then I'm saying, yep, you're absolutely right. We should be doing this. Um, so, but yeah, I, if I come up with an idea, I go to her and I'd say, Hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And she'll immediately say, yes. You know, all right. Let's look at how we can accomplish that. Or she'll say, no, you know, that doesn't make sense. And, you know, here's why, but, you know, let's table it and come back to it another time. And it may not make sense right then and there at the time in our lives, but maybe, you know, five years from now it will, or maybe that time has already passed, you know, so I've always, I always use her as a sounding board. Cool. So you, it seems like you guys have a process where, you know, you're both generating ideas and using each other. Yeah, I mean, we know the end game and we know what our belief systems are. I mean, we have, both of us have the same belief systems. We yeah. believe that, you know, we need to, you know, highlight the contributions of African Americans in food. Mm -hmm. And we need to do that as far back as we possibly can. And fortunately, we've surrounded ourselves with a, another group of people um, that feel the same way. So, you know, the concepts that we um, come up with, you know, are geared towards that. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's powerful to me. Right. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> so I, I think with just hearing about the obstacles and the way you name them, it seems you know, you've kind of named them as more external hurdles, right? So you said funding mm -hmm. and location. Um, and so for me, just listening, it sounds like, you know, where, where does that confidence come from where you're, you feel like you're able to bounce ideas off of 
you know, off with your wife and then think like, oh, I, we can make this a reality. It's not, you know, it wasn't, you mentioned, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of this or I'm afraid of that within myself. It's, you know, the, the hurdles you mentioned were more logistical. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, listen, I mean, <laughs> I could do anything that I put my mind to, you know, I need my wife's support, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, I could do anything that I want. And I know, I mean, especially in the food business, I know enough about the business now that, okay, if I wanted to do this, I could go out and do this myself. Or if I wanted to do this, you know, I know somebody um, that has more experience in this aspect of it than I do. Let's work together or let me pick their brain and get what I need out of that. And then it's full steam ahead. You know, that's, yeah, I, I don't have any fears of, you know, putting my visions out there, not anymore. Um, I did, obviously, at one time, I think all entrepreneurs do. Mm -hmm. You fear about taking that chance and, you know, call it jumping off the cliff, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I don't have that fear anymore. You know, obviously, I still have the same fears as everybody else. Do I not have enough capital? You know, um, is it the right time? You know, those are the things that you, you worry about. But, you know, do you have the right people in place? You know, but same things that everybody else worries about but having the confidence to step out there now no i i don't lack that because i'm confident in what i'm doing mm -hmm. i know that what we're doing is right um and it's just you know attracting the right partners to you to execute your vision because nobody can do one thing all themselves and i have so many different things that i'm doing right now <laughs> i need you know these good people around me to make sure that we execute it on the level that we want to um yeah, it's yeah. I, I gotta have I gotta have good people around me. And I if I have good people around me, I don't fear any attempts at doing what we wanna do. Yeah. So when you mentioned at the beginning <clears throat> when you were in first, you know, starting out in this industry, what were some of the fears that Oh goodness. <laughs> what are you gonna be accepted of that, you know? Everybody thinks about that. Am I, am, you know, are they going to like me? You know, can I cook good enough? And, you know, does this taste good? Does it make, you know, is it as good as this person's? Or I mean, everybody has those fears, you know? And then, you know, in, when you're young and you're impressionable, you are trying to, as much as you are um, being educated, you are still trying to impress other people. And we continue that through our entire career. The older you get, the less that matters to you. You know, I'm not as in, I don't, I don't look to try to impress people like that anymore. It's now about, okay, can we pull this narrative together mm -hmm. that makes sense? And when people see it, it sparks something in them, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. You still got to make a good plate of food and, you know, you don't want to disappoint anybody with what you do, but um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm going back to the other question, but, you know, I'm kind of fearless in that respect. You know, um, I just, um, I do what I think is right, mm -hmm. you know, and if I don't, my wife will let me know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and that's why I, I think it's been cool to watch your journey kind of on the sideline and... I guess we didn't say, you know, when I, when we met, I was working at the same restaurant that, you know, you were the head chef at and we, and then I went on to teach about food sustainability for years and worked in that. I've worked on farms. And so it is a passion of mine. And yeah. that, so we love, we love talking food and yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so it's, it's been cool to just see you not get hung up on things. And I know, you know, you're, more seasoned in your industry now, but it, I think there is kind of, that what is what makes you unique with being able to, you know, start projects and um, try them out and see what, see what's going to happen. And then, you know, creating this support network around yourself yeah. to succeed. Yeah. I mean, and I would say to anybody too, that, you know, is out there that's listening that may be interested in starting a project, Mm -hmm. um, that was involved in a project, you know, everything has a life cycle. Um, and restaurants are no different. You know, I'm speaking from that industry, from the hospitality industry, because that's what I'm a part of, but you know, everything has a life cycle. So don't get caught up on, um, you know, will this last for, you know, 50 years, 
you know, run its course. Be always thinking about the next idea because that idea may be nice and it hits at the right time and it lasts you for, you know, five years, maybe three years, um, and it runs very successfully. But you're going to know based on all the things that are coming and whether it makes sense to continue it or not. So don't be, you know, I, I just say to everybody, don't be caught up on this business lasting forever. Mm -hmm. Make an impact with it and then move on to the next thing. Because I know that's for me, those are one of the things that I always struggled with very young is I want to open up, you know, this thing that's going to be around, you know, 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if those kind of restaurants are still opening. Um, but there are restaurants that are opening that are making a huge impact on, you know, the way people think about food and how it's sourced and how you know, all the people involved in the chain are supposed to be treated and taken care of. Mm -hmm. Those types of restaurants are opening now, but we have no idea how long they will last. So, but I guess that's just my little advice to people, you know, be ready to pivot at any time. <laughs> so letting go, of, letting go of the outcome. And Listen, I, I mean, restaurants are businesses. You don't mm -hmm. open them unless you know you're going to make money. And right. absolutely. But, you know, understand too that that whatever it is it's going to have its course and it may be like a fast casual restaurant those things because it's lower dollar um it's a fast item people can go in pop out and get it it's you know kind of become a mainstay those restaurants have they'll last for a much longer time um and then the name recognition how many locations do you have and you know is it a household name those are the things that help with longevity um obviously you got to start with a good product um, but other restaurants, you know, non-chain restaurants, and there are some, still some old mom and pop places that have been open um, for a long time. I still try to go to them to keep them open. But, you know, don't be afraid that if, or don't be discouraged, rather, if your restaurant or if your concept over time, three, five years, is not what it was when it first opened those first two years. Because people are very fickle. People's mind change about food, and they move on to other things. They're going to come back to you, but brand-new restaurants get a lot of hype, and, you know, everybody wants to rush into them. You know, that may last for maybe nine months to a year, sometimes two years. Um, and you're running. You're building your customer base, and everything is going well. And then over time, sometimes, it, you know, it may um, slide off, and you have to be prepared to not – let that concept bankrupt you when you could be taking money and putting it into the next big thing and moving mm -hmm. on. So um, that's the kind of, you know, my little soapbox. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was going to say when you've, when you, what was the restaurant that you had um, before the, this past one? It was. Urban it, Soul. So Urban. we had Urban Soul. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I opened up Ida V's table. Yeah, Urban Soul and then Ida V's table. So when you close down a restaurant, or not close down, I should say, but when you feel like that project is finished or that, mm -hmm. I, you know, you're ready, how do you kind of look back on, do you see that as a, you know, a, a good thing or are you seeing it as a failure? Because it seems like you, you're able to pivot from one project to the next in a way where you I mean, don't yeah, get some, courage. Yeah. Yeah, it all depends on the circumstances. You know, I think anybody who, excuse me, you open up a restaurant or open up any business, you want it to last for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, when it doesn't, you you always, regardless of the circumstances, you still think, darn, you know, what could I have done, mm -hmm. you know, for that to, you know, still be running. So, yeah, you always have those thoughts in the back of your mind. But then when you calm down and you think about it rationally, you say, you know what, nope, that was just a stepping stone for the next you know, opportunity. And if anybody knows anything about the restaurant business, you're in there every day, all day. It mm -hmm. is a life, especially for a chef owner. Um, you live and breathe that restaurant. And there's not a lot, you know, that you can focus on outside of that. Um, or at least I couldn't, you know, um, just because of the level of my involvement in the restaurant. Um, so mm -hmm. moving on is, you know, it's, it's necessary. And I look back and say, yeah, you know, it was time for me to go. You left Urban Soul. 
you know, my wife and I, we traveled around for a while, did some things. Um, and then this opportunity came up to open up this restaurant and we went into that and keep in mind, that's a, a year plus project from concept to opening the restaurant. And, you know, we opened that, we were there for three years and, okay. you know, then some other opportunities came up. We said, you know what, we're going to travel. We went to um, Africa and came back and then we started working on heirloom. Um, heirloom is now um, starting to spread its wings. We're just really getting it off the ground, really. Um, you know, so that'll be nice. And then, you know, obviously we got the Maloma project that we're working on. Mm -hmm. That is, um, it's extremely important to us. And, you know, we're you know, looking at buying some land in Ghana um, to kind of mm -hmm. do a similar piece of, you know, work over there. I mean, yeah, you know, it's just, you never stop moving. And right. you look back and you say, man, I wish I could have worked, but you know what? It helped me, you know, continue along these steps. So. Right. So what, what advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out and feeling that initial stuck, you know, place of fear, or maybe they're wanting to leave their day job and try to take on a project of their own, what would you say to someone that is in that, that headspace where they haven't, um, they don't have the confidence of being in an industry for years or sort of just at that initial starting point? Listen, I think, you know, people are, you know, if I'm talking specifically about the food industry or any industry, listen, you, you know, jump out there. I'm not saying give up your job because you, want to, <laughs> yeah. you got bills to pay, you know, Keep paying the bills, but maybe there's a way that you can find to start that business part time, um, or maybe there's a way you can, you know, build the business, you know, and do as much as you can, schedule it around your work schedule, and then you know make it happen. But do it. I mean, you. I always say this to everybody: nobody's gonna believe in you if you don't believe in you. Mm -hmm. So if you are not willing to step out there on faith. I'm not saying throw away your job and, you know, go bankrupt. I'm merely saying, but be willing to put your name on something and get it out there, whether whatever that project is. Be willing to do that um, and work hard at it. Surround yourself with good people. Um, that's what I would do. You know, just don't – and don't, you know, take on more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, it's, if this is your first time doing it, make sure you consult with some people who have done it before. Um, at least pick their brain about it, you know, get an idea of, you know, okay, what's some of the successes you had? What's some of the obstacles you had? What, you know, did you have to do this? And I was told that I needed to do this, you know, mm -hmm. run those things by somebody who's got some experience. Um, I don't think there's any business now, you know, um, that a person wanted to physically jump out there and do that they could not do unless it involved massive technology and manufacturing and things like that where you needed a lot of space and you had to have permits and I mean all the other stuff that goes into that but a home-based business or if you're looking to go into a space with food or something like that it's you shouldn't let anything stop you it's if you have the desire to do it you should be able to do it I know for me I have been successful with some things and not so successful with other things but I learned through that process. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to step out there. Yeah, and I wanted to go back to, because I think this is an important aspect for you, especially with your wife and you guys being a super team. I, sure. <laughs> super I, team. I was curious, you mentioned earlier how, you know, if you didn't know something, you went out and tried to talk to somebody that did. So what kind of I mean, for you, what kind of support have you created or almost like a team, you know, when you talk about surrounding yourself with the kind of people that help you yeah. thrive, like what, what does that process look like for you? Um, well, I mean, you identify what you need, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, in any business nowadays, you need people, you know, that, um, you know, social media, um, you know, if you're opening up a food business, you need, you know, you know, skilled cooks, dishwashers, you, you need managers, you, you need all of those pieces. And then you decide what are the most important pieces of those things. You know, who can help me on an executive level 
um, so that I can continue to do and work on ideas and, you know, do all the things that I have to do. That's how I look at building a team, you know, and who can I trust? Yeah. Because, you know, I entrust, especially for myself, I entrust the things that I do, my brand in the people that I bring into my circle. So they have to understand who I am, what my vision is, and, you know, do they believe the same things that I believe about the business? Mm -hmm. You know, do they care about, you know, the quality of the food and the people that made it and the history behind it? If those things aren't important to them, then they probably won't be in my inner circle. Um, but you need to find who you're comfortable with, you know, get those people who bring something to the table um, that are willing to tell you the truth. You know, those are the people that you want to surround yourself with. Um, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And then what are, so I know you mentioned some of your projects that you're working on now. Do you want to, do you want to go into more detail? On the project? Yeah, let's um, hear about them. Let's hear more about them. Um, well, let's see, you know, so heirloom, um, you know, we talked about that briefly, you know, heirloom, actually, it's, um, it's heirloom food group. Um, LLC and heirloom food group is um, our kind of uh, umbrella that all of these concepts that we have are working mm -hmm. under. Um, so, you know, the first concept was heirloom caterers. So heirloom mm -hmm. caterers is, um, um, is your really, you know, typical high end catering company, but it's not so typical. You know, we do things differently. Um, mm -hmm. The way that we source, we only source locally and organically. We only use all natural products. We don't use anything that is um, prefabricated with the exception of ketchup and mayonnaise because I just don't have time to make them. Um, <laughs> but everything else we make right. in-house. Um, and we want to deliver, you know, once again, these African-centered ingredients on a very mm -hmm. high level. Um and that's what heirloom represents to me. We are going to be doing stuff um, with catering and um, specialty private dinners that, you know, people have come to see some of the stuff that I did in my former life with my mm -hmm. dad for dinners. We're just taking that to a level where we can now do that on a larger scale with events. Um, yeah, so that's what I think about with that. Um, heirloom, you know, is um, special special project to my wife and I. Um, and then on the other side of that, we have Preserve. And Preserve is the sister catering company to Heirloom. Um, and Preserve is more for um, more the more comfortable, pr approachable foods that you would find, and typically on a Southern menu. So if you were thinking about, you know, what, you know, someone in the Deep South would eat, you know, for a holiday, you know, you would find that on our menus, you know, right. some of those celebratory dinners and things like that. That's what you would find with the preserve menu. So those are the catering concepts. And then, you know, we're working on a fast casual concept mm -hmm. um, and we're still deciding what we're going to name it. Um, <laughs> we, we have a concept that's registered on the modern soul. Um, okay. So we're not sure if we're going to launch that one first or it's going to be the other one. Um, okay. So yeah, you know that, and, you know, I'm working on a book deal. Um, yeah. That's, you know, yeah. Yeah, and then we got on the other side, um, I have some separate partners that are working on this project called the Maloma Heritage Center. Um, and that is- project. Yeah, this one's very, very special because it's, you know, it's about us collecting um, information. You know, we have a number of partners that are, um, you know, heavyweights in the industry. Um, and they are going to be helping us put together this beautiful project on 38 acres um, hopefully in the, uh, on St. Helena Isle in South Carolina. So, I mean, it's going to be special three kitchens and they represent different time periods throughout the African diaspora in terms of how we started cooking. And mm -hmm. the final kitchen will be that more modernist kitchen that we'll be able to do, you know, some really extravagant dinners out of, and, you know, um, really high end presentations. Um, but that's what, you know, this thing is about is that's, you know, having all of these different things from our history and, you know, having a place, a building on the um, property rather, that is going to house all the documentation and all the artifacts and, you know, all the information that we found 
Um, we'll have three different gardens that will support these separate kitchens, um, outdoor, you know, um, like event spaces. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, what we're talking about is just crazy. I mean, it's um, nothing like it exists right now. And right. I couldn't keep talking about it for somebody else trying to steal the idea. Uh, but, um, <laughs> I love yeah. it. I feel like it's a culmination of so many of the things you've done. And it's it's sort of bringing a lot of those ideas to life in a really special way. Yeah, see, my brother chimed in. I said, my dreams are coming true for our family. <laughs> I sure hope so, brother. You know, that's, um, yeah, that's what this is all about for me. So in that, how does that tie back into your why of, you know, you mentioned that earlier, why it's so important for you to continue to celebrate African-American food culture with your cooking and, and, and some, with this project, it's going a step further with educating people, educating, you know, ecotourism, uh, creating this connection with the land there. So you're going to be growing food and providing a space, physical space. So I was just wondering how that, how that kind of ties into your big why, why you do this. Why do I do the work that I do? Yeah. Um, because there are many people that came before me that, um, you know, never got any recognition for something that they created. You know, it's, this thing is much bigger than me. It's, you know, all the people that came before me that, you know, cooked in, you know, somebody's home or on somebody's land. Um, and they created this cuisine and not just one cuisine, but several cuisines, if you break them up. You know, and I mentioned them before, and I, I didn't say that in jest, that it, you know, if you talk about the creation of what is considered American cuisine and you break them down into categories, whether it's, you know, soul food, Southern food, um, barbecue, Cajun, you know, Creole, those, all of those things were derived from the hands of Africans. Um, and a lot of those cuisines were created by the enslaved, um, you know, on this land. So all I want to do is to reclaim a narrative and let people understand that, you know, you can't, you can take away somebody's freedom, so to speak, but out of their struggle will come something beautiful. And, you know, we didn't even have an education at some point to write stuff down, to read. So recipes that we owned, that we created, were translated by someone who owned us. Mm -hmm. So then in turn, they own not only us, but they own the legacy that we put out. And that's what I'm out to reclaim because mm -hmm. I love all the cuisines of the world as a you know, classically trained chef. You know, French cuisine is always gonna be, you know, near and dear to the hearts of any chef because mm -hmm. of its place in in our food world. Mm -hmm. But for me as a person, there is nothing more important to me than African food. There is nothing more centered in who I am than African food. Um, and those techniques can be shared throughout all these different cuisines. You know, I can teach the French something. The French can teach me something. That's how the world is supposed to work. You know, um, and I just want to be one of the people who are helping to reclaim this narrative and tell the truth. Um, these people that came before me I stand on their shoulders and if it, you know, wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. Right. And it, you went, and I'm sure many of people who follow your Instagram know about your trip to Africa. Was that last yeah. year? <laughs> no, this year. It was this year. What? Oh, it was yeah, it was, I, I, can I believe it? Like, doesn't it seem like it, ago. even for me, <laughs> it seems like it was, you know, a year ago now, but yeah, it was just in March. We went, um, uh, we landed in Senegal, I believe it was March 9th, um, my oldest son's birthday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, powerful, powerful. Right. And I mean, everybody knows, um, you know, I lost my oldest son. And to be in, you know, Senegal for the first time ever being on the African continent, you know, I land on his birthday. Um, powerful, powerful. 
ridiculous. Yeah. But I mean, Africa was, um, you know, being in Senegal, Gambia, we went on this culinary tour with a good friend of ours, um, Ada Brown, who runs Roots to Glory Tours. She's a big part of the Maloma Project. Um, um, should I venture to say, without her, the Maloma Project wouldn't even exist. Um, so she's very, very important to us. Um, but we went to Senegal, Gambia, we traveled around, we ate, we talked, we learned. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Um, changed my life. Mm -hmm. Changed my life. And now, you know, how are you kind of tying that in? You have, obviously, that's going to have an effect now on your work and mm -hmm. maybe even spur new ideas or things that you wanted to infuse in the work you're doing now, your different projects. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, listen, um, I I just want to keep learning. I mean, that's, I mean, and I'm, I'm not one to sit down and, you know, read a book from end to end. I'm about experiencing it. You know, that's, that's how I learn the best. That's just me. Some other people are better with, you know, reading, you know, information out of a book and then taking that and, you know, um, executing it. For me, I just need to see it. I need to be around the people that create it. I need to be, I need to feel and smell. And, you know, that's what my life is about now. I, that's what inspires me. So being in Africa, what that did for me was, it, it gave me this sense of, you know, I've got a responsibility. You, know, mm -hmm. you have an opportunity. You've been given this voice and this platform. Do something with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, I'm, I'm happy. You know, I'm happy that, you know, I, I was able to make that trip. It, it, it changed everything for me. And so, what, where's the book coming in play? What's happening with the oh, book? Goodness. <laughs> you know, um, right now we're, um, you know, we're uh, just really in the pitch stage. So we're, you know, pulling together um, the pitch and, you know, my, you know, my, my, my publicist knows about this stuff. I don't know anything about it. I'm, you know, I, I have a story to tell, but I don't know the business behind books. Mm -hmm. um, but I know it's going to take some time before we get it out to the marketplace. Because mm -hmm. um, we're still, we, you know, we're not even finished developing it yet. So, but yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be about me. Um, but it's also going to be more so about, um, you know, my thoughts about, you know, the contributions of African Americans in what we consider to be Southern cuisine um, in the state of Maryland. You know, mm -hmm. because Maryland is a southern state. I know many people don't want to think about it that way, but it is. <laughs> um, it is right below the Mason-Dixon line. Um, actually, I think part of Maryland runs through the Mason-Dixon well, the Maryland Mason-Dixon line runs through part of Maryland. Um, mm -hmm. But we are the northernmost southern state. Mm -hmm. And even though um, there were Union and Confederate soldiers here, it was, you know, that is a history. And what I want this book to be about is me finding these jewels and being able to talk about this information through um, the lens of a chef living here in Maryland. Right. And it seems like, see, some of the people I've worked with too are, you know, it, what I'm noticing with you is just you're juggling a couple of, or a few, few different projects, if not more yeah. secret ones you haven't told us about yet. But it's... Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not yet, but it seems like they're all connected to yeah. sort of this same like center point for you. And it, it seems like that's what's fueling your ability to juggle multiple things at once. Yeah. That are sort yeah, of and that one, like once again, just having those good people around you, you know, because, right. you know, they're helping me and, you know, helping, you know, keep everything in track. You know, it's, you know, there are a lot of moving pieces. So you got to have good people around you. But yeah, for me, everything is connected. Mm -hmm. You know, I want everything that I do to make sense for the next thing, because when you have a personal brand, that brand needs to represent who you are. And mm -hmm. I am not, I do the same things all the time. You know, my wife will tell you, I'm very much, a, I do the same thing. Um, that's who I am. So when we're creating projects, all of the same things are intertwined somehow in mm -hmm. these different things that we're doing. I mean, you can see the connections. It's, you know, very easy to see. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, I think it just made sense for me. Other people may have, you know, whenever they do something, they want a completely different concept that ties nothing mm -hmm. into what you're doing. But um, there's so many stories to tell about what we have to do. Um, everything ties together for me. Right. 
And so how I know you are doing a fundraiser now for the Maloma yeah, project. Yeah, yeah. How how can we all support you all with, with that project right now? Well, um, you can go to maloma.com. That's M-U-L-O-M-A dot com. Um, and you can click on that um, take action and then donate button. And I think we have a, a GoFundMe page that's live. So, you know, mm -hmm. please support. Um, you know, what we're doing is trying to raise money, you know, to get this project up and running. Um, all the partners in the project are purchasing the land, but then we have to do, you know, a lot of infrastructure. We've got to, you know, get everything done on that land for this project. So um, we're raising funds for that. And, you know, we'll, we'll have other fundraisers going on. We have some mm -hmm. partners out there. Not, I can mention them. Um, Michael Twitty, if everybody's not familiar with him, who is uh, a writer, um, an incredible person, is a good friend of ours, um, won two James Beard Awards for his book called The Cooking Gene. Um, and he's involved in many, many other projects. Um, he's working on a book now. Um, then we have um, uh, Chef B.J. Dennis, who won't live on the land, but he's certainly going to be a big advisor for us because he's from um, South Carolina, from Charleston mm -hmm. in particular. Um, but he knows um, the community and is a part of South Carolina. So, you know, his work with the Gullah Geechee is just unprecedented. Um, I call him a national treasure because I think that's what he is. But he's going to be advising us and helping us on the project. Um, then we got Mashama Bailey, who is um, executive chef and partner at the Gray in Savannah, Georgia. Um, she's one of the partners on the project, also won a James Beard Award. Um, just incredible chef, incredible human being. Um, let's see, who we got? You know, obviously, um, Kaya. I, mean, I think you've met mm -hmm. Kaya before. Mm -hmm. um, and Kaya, um, you know, worked with us at the restaurant. He was my personal assistant. Um, yeah. He's working, still working with me now on the heirloom side. Um, and he's going to be a part of this project, and he's smart as a whip, and he is, you know, um, social media stuff, you know, internet marketing. I mean, that's his wheelhouse. He knows it. Not only, but he's a, a trained actor, and, and he's just a very, very talented person. So what he brings to the table is very important. Then we have mm -hmm. uh, Trina Robinson, who is um, like a filmmaker, and she does, you know, archival work through documentary it, I mean, incredible. She went to Africa with us too. Um, then you got, you know, Rooster Glory, who is a Don Brown, who, mm -hmm. like I said, was really the catalyst for this project. Um, she is very important. Um, let's see who else we have. Um, oh, Maria and mm -hmm. Adrian. Well, Maria Moore, who is Adrian Liscom's sister. Adrian Liscom um, runs and owns the Uptown Cafe in um, Wisconsin. She was also important in getting me to, uh, you know, cook at the James Beard house. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, Adrian Liscom is very important in the project. Just smart as a whip. I'm surrounded by a bunch of, you know, and beautiful, intelligent women who, um, who know exactly what they're doing, who are focused, um, and we're going to get it done. And then we got Maria, who is her sister, who worked in, um, who works for the government in. And she works in agriculture and stuff like that. So, you know, what she does is, um, you know, very important mm -hmm. um, in how, what she brings to the table. So we got all these people, you know, have these expertise and, yes. you know, that are passionate about what we're doing, that believe in the project. Right. And that's what's going to make it successful because everybody has a role to play. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody is, you know, you know, shooting for the same goal. So, yeah, I really look forward to this project. Really look right. to it. So what's what's kind of your vision for this next year? I mean, given the limitations we all have, but what's what's kind of well, getting excited now moving forward? Well, it's funny, you know, I would just I just got off a meeting talking about that with our um, our heirloom um, group people, and mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at the next year; it's crazy, you know. Um, I know Maryland um, just reduced the number of in dining and outside dining. Mm -hmm. um, I think down to 50% again, I think in then Baltimore city, it's reduced down to 25%. So, and with this COVID expanding, instead of, you know, decreasing, mm -hmm. we don't know what it's going to look like, you know, so we're just trying to plan virtually, you know, what are the things that we're going to be doing virtually 
to, um, you know, keep the business rolling. And, um, you know, with the Maloma project is, you know, raising funds, you know, um, working on, we just got a, um, a contract for the surveyor, which is incredible because that surveyor is going to help go out on the land and, you know, delineate where everything can, you know, what the land looks like, first of all, and then, you know, get that over to our architect so we can see where everything can go. Um, you know, those are our projects right now. And then developing this fast casual concept that um, we will launch, hopefully, you know, if not within a year, the next year, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are the things that I'm working on and it takes all of my time. <laughs> and I love the concept that with the Ida B. Wells restaurant and, mm -hmm. you know, I know a lot of people that do follow you that live in Baltimore are familiar with it, but can you just kind of go into a little brief description of how that concept came to life? And for me, it just seemed, it was such a unique and cool restaurant. I loved going there. And there were so many little details that I know you and your wife put so much thought into. And I, to me, when I, you know, when I moved back to the area and came to your restaurant, I just felt like, wow, this is, I can just see a lot of your visions in reality. You know, you made them come to life in that space. Yeah. I mean, listen, I was fortunate at the time to, um, when I left, um, when we sold Urban Soul, yeah. And we sold the business and, you know, my wife and I were, we had done some traveling we were taking a break. Um, and we were working on another restaurant concept with some, actually with a, one of my partners now, um, we were working on another concept and then you know, we just couldn't find a space and, you know, where we hadn't gotten frustrated, but we were, you know, just taking our time because finding a space was just becoming difficult. And then this opportunity came up, um, um, I got a call from the CEO of this news network downtown and they had the space in their building and they wanted to open up a restaurant and, you know, they really wanted a black chef involved and would I come down and talk to him? So, you know, um, went down and talked to him, you know, they were interested in doing uh, some type of pizza concept in the space of the 6,000 square feet and thinking to myself, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> I'm, I wouldn't do a pizza concept in this space, um, 6,000 square feet on this corner. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, it may have worked, but I didn't think it would have. Um, and more importantly, it's not something I would have wanted to be involved in. I would help you get up and running, you know, because I do some consultant work. I will help you get it up and running. But after that, um, you know, I have no interest in running it. So, you know, I left that meeting and they said, well, you know, okay, well, what do you think about doing? What would you do in this space? Mm. And you know, I think a week or two later, my wife and I put together a pitch. I mean, because we pretty much had it all done anyway, because we've got concepts, mm -hmm. you know, just sitting around. Um, and this was an extension of what Urban Soul was. Everything I do is an evolution. So it was the mm -hmm. next step in the evolution process. So that's how Ida B's Table came to be. You know, mm -hmm. they had the financing, they had the property, they just needed a concept. And, you know, I brought that concept. Um, and what would yeah. you say? If you were to describe, how would you describe the concept of Ida B. Wells? Oh, for, those people, table, for people who haven't been there yet. <laughs> oh, Ida B. Table. Ida B. Table was, you know, yeah. um, you know, was this, we considered it modern soul food. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, once again, as us, you know, you know, paying homage to those people that came before us, like Ida B. Wells, you know, this mm -hmm. woman who was, you know, just incredibly, um, you know, devoted and committed to changing what she saw wrong. So she spoke the truth about it. You know, mm -hmm. once we decided um, to call the place Ida B's Table, naming mm -hmm. it after Ida B. Wells, we had to make sure that everything that we did in that space was right, mm -hmm. um, that told the truth. And if that's going to be through food, and if I'm going to be involved, then you're going to get all of that. And that's, that's what we did. Um, I was happy to be a part of that. Um, it was an incredible opportunity for me. Um, yeah, you know, it landed me on um, Chopped, and that, um, you know, that's been, you know, extremely good for me. So, you know, I've got, you know, food <laughs> that has been great. You know, so I don't, um, yeah, I mean, everything, you know, 